tell you, it is a crispy one out here tonight. Uh, get that light turned off. It's really not that late out, but as you guys know, in the winter time here in uh, here in Ontario, Canada, the uh, the daytime is very very short, so it's really not that late out. But I try to hide out in the shop at any time I can't be outside and in the bush. What I'm doing today is I'm getting my equipment ready for. Uh, the next day when the sun comes back up so I can get back out cutting. Now, um, what we're going to do first off is I'm going to check over my chainsaws. I think I got I think I got to sharpen up one of the chains. And then I also have a few blades that I'm going to set and uh, sharpen using my equipment here for my sawmill. Before that happens, though, I sort of need these uh, fluorescent light bulbs you see up on the ceiling to warm up because it is not overly uh, warm in here. And if those things don't get brighter, I'm not going to be able to see too much. It's about negative 20 Celsius, negative 4 Fahrenheit. Uh, we're starting to get into the colder days of winter, and I'm starting to feel it. You guys can see I got gloves on, but don't worry. Wow, I got my sludge. So, welcome back. We're going to get down to it. Glad you guys are all along. If you're brand new here, well, this is the inside of my shop. It's pretty much a glorified pole barn. I got some equipment in here. If we make our way over this way... I got some projects on the go over here and well I got projects on the go over here and well this is where I hang out when I can't be outside so welcome back I'm gonna have some sludge I'm gonna get things fired up and we'll see how uh, sharp things are here we go okay well the lights are getting a bit brighter here I'll sort of introduce you to some of my equipment if you haven't been around too much I have two general chainsaws that I like to use I also have a steel that I don't use all that often. Uh, my dad actually has it right now. He uh, did a little switcheroo with me for a while. Uh, oftentimes he uses this saw. Instead, he's got my steel right now. I'm using this thing. This saw is what I use for uh, limbing. This is my Husqvarna 435. This thing's a great little saw. Uh, to be honest, unless you're cutting massive trees, this thing does everything I need to. You put a sharp chain on there and you're good to go. Uh, fires up every time, as I said, a really good little saw. That's what that is for, my limbing saw. This saw over here is my go-to for most things. You probably see it in my hands most days. My Husky 555, great saw, 60cc saw, relatively light. Um, it came out with some of the newer technology. This has the auto-tune, definitely a high rubbing saw. Uh, I'm very impressed with it. I run a 20 inch uh, chain on there, 20 inch bar, and the other one I run a 16. So this is my go-to. I do a little bit of limbing with this, but that one is definitely more fun because it's lighter. Anyways, we're gonna get this thing opened up. Oftentimes when I bring it into the shop, it's in the evening. Um, usually it's in the evening because during the day I like to be using it cutting. I bring it into the shop in the evening, uh, get it fueled up again. 50 to one is what I use for fuel. I run premium with uh, two, -stroke, uh, two stroke oil. Uh, then I just throw my uh, bar oil in there. One thing I'm going to note right about this time of year, even before now, when the temperatures start getting colder, I start using a colder bar oil mix. A little bit more viscous or thicker, doesn't fly off the bar. Let me back up there. A little bit less viscous, and so it stays on the bar, but uh, by having it less viscous, meaning it's more slippery, it uh, actually gets around the bar and lubricates it. In the summertime, you can use stuff that's just a little bit thicker, and uh, that way it... Um, Provides adequate lubrication. I think I got that right. Let's, uh, as I said, let's get this thing opened up. We'll check things over. Uh, first things first, I'm going to loosen off the bar nuts. And before I go any further, I'm gonna put on my safety glasses. If you haven't been here before, not all that long ago, I took a uh, impact driver with a Robertson bit and I accidentally jammed her into the old eye. I wear safety glasses at all times now. Although some of you might think it's little bit overkill I can tell you the first time you jam something like a Robertson bit into your eye well you'll be wearing safety glasses just like I will every time one thing I can tell you when it's this cold out the trouble is everything starts to freeze and so this saw here I went from the bush and then I brought it in here well any moisture that had sawdust in it inside this inside this cover is probably gonna be frozen not to mention it gets colder out your fingers stop working there we go so we're definitely in in time for a cleaning 
if I'm thinking, which some days I am and some days I'm not, I actually take the saw into the house and I warm it up and then all this stuff just pries right off nice and easy. And fortunately, this is not frozen on here, so it looks like it's gonna come off nicely. Anyways, you know, some people get in there with a fine tooth comb and yeah, I do every once in a while, but let's be honest, I wanna cut more than I wanna clean this thing and so I do enough cleaning so that it's good and reliable but I'm not going to polish this thing up by any means. While I'm in here you guys might know this already I find that you guys see the uh, the spring the spring there that goes around the clutch I find that in the winter time uh, you get a bit of caked on sawdust in there it freezes and then your uh, your chain brake doesn't work and so I always make sure to get in there and clean that dust right out from the edge of that spring. First thing you can have is you're out in the bush and you know you want to cut some trees cut some material the next thing you know stuff's not working on you and then you're downtime especially dangerous if you're felling trees cutting them down and you start making a face cut or whatever and then you go around to the to the back cut and for whatever reason something breaks on you well that's a dangerous situation to have a tree half cut so at the very least, I always make sure the saw is never going to have a breakdown. At least not one that's preventable. All right, well, that's going to take a little while longer. Use a brush every once in a while. And I even use my air compressor. Yeah, that's pretty good for now. So we'll call that good for now. I know for a fact this chain is relatively dull. Truth be told, I drove it into the ground by mistake. If you're new to chainsaws, you don't ever want to drive this into the ground. You don't want to cut dirt. Uh, it'll dull it in a second, maybe two. Anyways, I drove it into the dirt by mistake, cutting in the snow, and as a result, it's relatively dull. So it's time for, time for a cleaning or a sharpening. And although I got gloves on, I still don't like wearing them. There we go. So I have a tooth on here. And you may not be able to see it, but I got a tooth on here that's pretty worn. That's one's worn pretty good right there. You see on the very, the very uh, starting edge of that, you'll see how it's rounded down a bit. We don't want that. So we're going to cut it back here in just a second. You can see the same thing on that tooth. See how the front cutting edge is rounded down? We want that nice and sharp. Like that tooth looks good. You know, it's nice and sharp on the leading edge. That's what we're going for. So we're gonna run that in just a second on the sharpener. I'll show you guys exactly what I do. Anyways, there's the bar. It just came off this way. Every time I get in here and I actually clean things, I flip the bar over and so that we get even wear on the bar. That's why from time to time, you'll see myself and other people with the bar and the words are upside down. It's because they flipped the bar to get even wear on both sides. Anyways, just got to remember, got to go back word side up. Reason I don't like gloves. I don't get a good grip on things. We're going to just clean that little groove here. And they actually, this, uh, this scrunch, I think they call it, this scrunch here, it doesn't have the best, uh, the best flathead there. I have some, they have a perfect groove and they fit right in. Right in that groove nicely. Just cleaning out any dirt. Now, this is a relatively inexpensive bar. You can get all kinds of different bars with different uh, different price price ranges. This bar does not have a spot to add grease to the uh, to the sprocket on the nose. Some of them do, and it must be my other bar. But some of them have a little hole there, and you can use this thing. Let's see if I can find it. There we go. You can use this thing right here, this push and lube deal. And uh, basically what you would do if there was a hole, it goes somewhere like that and you push down on it and then it greases that sprocket. This bar, not the case. Another thing I do with these bars, in addition to uh, cleaning out that top groove, I make sure that the holes here, 
You guys might not be able to see it. See that hole right there? You gotta make sure that hole is open so that when your bar oil comes out of your chainsaw, it actually goes into that groove. If that gets all bunged up and uh, filled with who knows, snow or ice and freezes, you may not get bar oil into the grooves and then you're not lubricating your bar. That'll be bad. Okay, we'll just leave that for now. And then the power head, I do the same thing. I just give her a check over. And you guys, I don't know, you guys see that down there? Come on in here. Yeah, come on in there. I just try to get all this gum stuff out of here. Any sawdust I leave in there, inevitably it'll get ice on it. And I clean out that little slot. Anyways, I just clean all this out. This is a Husqvarna. This model has an outboard clutch. So there's the clutch mechanism. Uh, some of the uh, other manufacturers, they have an inboard clutch. My other steel over there, I actually forgot about. I've got a steel, um, what do you call it, a 660. It's a clone, actually. It's made by Hulse Forma. But regardless, it's got an inboard clutch. So I just get all the hard stuff off here. And I didn't do that thorough of a job, but if you guys can imagine, you get it off. I use the use the brush. I also use the air compressor and get her cleaned right out. It's also a good time for me to check these springs. Uh, I have had before, not on the Husqvarna, but on my uh, other chainsaw, my. Um, Holes forma. I've had a uh, spring break, and as a result, that had to be replaced. Anyways, that looks good there. And last thing we'll do here, I'll just check the air filter. Now, it is the winter time, but uh, some people will say you don't really have to deal with that in the winter, the uh, air air cleaner. But I deal with it year round, just to, just to be sure. You can see there's the. Air filter also gives me an opportunity just to see what's going on with the engine here. Make sure there's nothing in here, little bits and pieces of twig and whatnot. And you can see there, a little dirty but not too bad. Every once in a while, I'll just give that a blowout with the compressor as well. So everything's good there. We'll put her back. Who it's cold on the hands tonight. Oh, I don't complain too often about the temperature. Tonight I'm complaining. Anyways, there you go. That's that. Nice little power head there. We'll get the chain sharpened up. Put her all back together. That saw should be good to go. All right, guys. Well, let's have a look at my little chain sharpening setup. And this is for chainsaw chains. Now, uh, it may be a bit hard to see in here. I got the biggest bright light on I, I got, but... Right here is an Oregon chainsaw chain sharpener. I bought this probably oh, probably three years ago, give or take. This thing was around 320 Canadian, I think. I don't know what it costs now. Uh, definitely paid for itself just for, um, just for simplicity, I guess. This thing's very simple to use and it's also uh, saving me some time because I'm not out having to hand file everything. This thing really shines when you have a really damaged chain on a chainsaw because you can cut back a lot of material really quickly. Whereas if you were using one of these guys, which don't get me wrong, I still use them from, from time to time. If you're using a round file, it just takes you a lot longer. So this thing's nice. You can also go easy on it and just touch up each of the, uh, each of the teeth if you need to. That's what we'll be doing here today. In the manual that comes with this thing, there are the settings, depending on the, the chain you're using. And so I've got this already set up for what I like to use. Um, if you have a look here, the settings, I tend to go about 25 degrees, 26 degrees on this, uh, on this angle here. And then the other angle that I'm dealing with is uh, it tilts backwards. So you'll see the chain actually tilts this way or this way. I've got that at about 10 degrees. And then the other thing, according to the manual, is I've got the, uh, the head angle set here. And if you look up at that back part there, you can see the angle. Uh, I think I'm, if I remember right, it's like 55 degrees or something. Don't quote me on that, but it is in the manual. Uh, that's what I got it set up for. So 
let's put a chain on here. Uh, once, once the chain goes on there, you'll be able to see it in action. What happens is the chain, once it sits there, it doesn't actually have to come off until it's sharpened on uh, both, uh, both teeth, uh, both directional teeth. And so uh, that's very handy. Let's get her set up. You guys can see what we're dealing with. So that just sort of sits in that slot there. And the hardest part working with the gloves is moving this stuff. There we go. Sits right in that slot there. This lever essentially, once you get everything set up, it just locks the chain in position and then you come down and uh, give her a go with the old wheel. Uh, you just want to make sure that the wheel is profiled exactly how you want it. And uh, for my case, it's good to go. So when I'm setting this thing up, I just pull up an old pail. And what I'm doing is I'm going to look at the teeth and you'll notice some teeth go this way, some go this way. Uh, the way it's set up now, if you guys can imagine, it's designed to cut these teeth, the teeth that are sort of angled this way. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the most damaged tooth, and I know there's a good damaged one or two on here, but they all appear to be going the other way. But anyways, I'm looking for the most damaged tooth because that will be the most amount of material that I'll want to remove. Alternatively, if you don't have any teeth that are really damaged, it's just lightly dulled because of use, then you're just going to pick any tooth to start on. And I'll just pick one to start on. Doesn't really matter per se. Let's just say I'm going to start on that tooth. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to mark it with a marker. And you can do whatever you want. Maybe you don't want to do this, but I mark it with a marker because I don't want to sharpen the tooth twice. I only want to hit them once. And uh, that way, if I mark it, I know I'm going to start on that tooth. And you'll see this piece I just flipped over. Uh, all you're doing here, this will line up. This will line up and provide sort of a stop. So when you pull on the chain backwards to sort of hold it in place and then you lock it in, it's going to keep that tooth from moving backwards uh, while you're locking it in. And then all I do is I just very closely have a look at where the where the uh, grindstone's going to hit the hit the tooth. And I had this set up before for a different uh, a different chain, and so. I'm going to have to make some adjustments. I'm going to have to pull the chain back just a little bit. And I've got two adjustments back here, which will allow me to move that, that advance uh, arm there forward and back. And that actually looks quite good. That was a good guess. And so if I think I'm close, I can just lock this in place. We'll lock that in place. I always put just a little bit of back pressure. I pull the chain back a little bit so it's right against this, this um, what do you call it, metal arm. And then I lock her in place firmly. And I just check it one more time. And that looks pretty good. And you'll notice the marker. That's the first tooth I'm going to hit. So just make sure when I get back to it, uh, I stop just before it. Great thing about this unit, when you turn it on, it actually has a light on it, so kind of nice. And I'm just watching just before I touch the tooth where it's going to touch. Very light touch. And uh, you guys jump around here so you can have a look-see. You probably won't even be able to see it. It's that tooth there, but what I'm looking for... Yeah, here, let me grab a light. You guys got a light. Ooh, it's cold out. Hands are cold. Okay. You guys see the tooth that I just did right there? You guys see how you can see the shiny metal? That's what you're going for. Just make sure that shiny metal goes all the way through the tooth, right down into the gullet. And when I'm talking about gullet, I'm talking about the bottom of that tooth, all the way up to the very top leading edge. So I'm just going to have a quick look at it and make sure it's Sufficient for what I'm doing and that looks pretty good to be honest the top edge could use a little bit more And because it could use a little bit more I'll just unlock it and I'm going to advance This arm forward just a little bit. So the grinding stone takes off just a little bit more. So I'm just gonna Just a little just like that and then we'll lock her in place and we'll try her again You're probably saying you're probably saying, gee, it looks like you're taking a lot of material off. And keep in mind, some of these, whoops, some of these teeth are a little bit damaged. And so they're going to have to have more taken off. 
Now, if the, if the uh, chain wasn't damaged, you know, I'm just gonna be barely touching this and that will be all you need to get them sharp. When it's not this cold out, you can move a bit better. And ideally, you want to take off as little material as possible. That'll come down to, as I said, whether your chain's damaged or not. See how that barely took any off the top? That is a bit of an issue. The truth is, because it barely took anything off there, if I wanted every tooth to be ground down the exact same, I would now reset this to whatever that tooth took off because that took off very little. And all I'm doing is I'm gonna look for that black mark, which I see it coming up. And my eyes are, can't quite see here with the uh, glare off that light. I think we got a little further to go. You can always check the, uh, check the gullet too. If you see it shiny, you know you've sharpened it before. I think that's our last one right there. No, I actually did that already. So there we go. That is all of it on that side. And I gotta tell you, my hands are freezing. I gotta tell you, I don't complain a lot about the cold, but I am not seasoned yet, I don't think. We're under an extreme cold weather warning tonight. And uh, I think we're gonna get down to about negative 32 or something Celsius. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but I can tell you it's not warm. Okay, as I said, let's flip this thing around. We'll do the rest of the, uh, do the rest of the chain there. So we did the, we did the teeth going that way. We're now gonna do the teeth going this way. All you really have to do in this case is loosen this off here. And uh, then what you're gonna do on this dial it started at 26 or 25 or 27 degrees, can't remember exactly, but just after the 25 this way, we're gonna move it over to this direction on the same measurement. So right over to about 26, 27 right there. And the last thing you're gonna do, that goes all the way this way. Then you lock her in position. The head angle on this unit stays the same. And so then you just gotta pick a tooth to start on. And we're gonna, maybe we'll start with that one. If you guys get right in here, you can see what I'm doing. Whew. Okay, have a look down there. No, down there. Okay, see that right there? I just have to make sure that that is in line with the middle of the tooth. And we'll just crank her in just a little bit again. Okay, that should be good. And once again, I'm gonna use the marker. And we'll just, we'll just mark it in here so we know what we're starting on. I can barely see that as it is. It's so cold, the marker's barely working. Okay, we might have to be especially cautious so we don't do the same one twice. Locked in position. And I sit on a bucket so I can see. I suppose you could mount this higher, but it allows me to see real well. Just gotta remember to look for that marker. The mark you made so you know where to stop. Generally, you can see it like I can see it's the next one. And so I know that's good enough. Gone all the way around. So guys, that's it. That is a sharp chain. Now the last thing I'm gonna do in just a minute, uh, I'm gonna take a flat file and I'm going to file down the depth gauges. Uh, let's go do that over on the bench.
I don't just drink uh, sludge for the camera, I tell you, I do love this stuff. Uh, let's get the, uh, what do you call it, chain back on here. And the reason I put the chain on the saw first is that allows me to, uh, allows, allows me to file down those depth gauges easily. So we'll put that on. And let's make sure we get the bar in the right spot here. We're going to put it, letters facing up. Sure, we put the chain on the right way. Wouldn't that be fun? I actually have to face the other way. I don't know about you guys. I can show you the way that uh, you might see it better, but and I won't get it on easily. And this, once again, is one of those times I hate wearing gloves, especially with the sharp chain. They just the chain just sticks to the uh, what do you call it? Chain just sticks to the uh... All right, well, let's get this back on here. We're going to put the bar on and we'll put the chain on the bar and then I'll file down the flat uh, depth gauges right on the saw. Letters up this time around, so we flipped it from last time, and we'll make sure we get the get the teeth going the right way. And I'm sort of putting this chain on backwards, not literally, but what I mean is facing you guys. Normally, I have it facing me. I think I'm going to have to do that. There we go. Another uh, reason I hate wearing gloves when I'm doing work like this: the the sharp teeth tend to stick on the glove. Anyways, here we go. We got it in position here. Looks good. Uh, just if you didn't know, you can, once the, once the chain goes on there, just pull the bar forward a little bit and it just pulls the tension out or uh, adds the tension in, I guess. And then uh, we'll go ahead and put the cover back on and I'm going to have to face me to do this or I won't get her on. Pretty good. Making sure that the spring here is clean, especially you don't want material between the spring and the, uh, the clutch there. One nice thing with this Husqvarna, it's got the bar nuts that are retained. Like it, it, they don't, they don't just uh, like see how they're they're stuck there. Nothing like dropping this in the snow. If you out, if you're out in the bush and you're fiddling around, you know, changing the changing the uh, what do you call it? Chain out in the woods. Next thing you know, you take these bar nuts off. They go into the snow, and that's the end of them. Oh, it's cold. I can barely handle this. Before I tighten this up, I always just make sure that the, uh, the screw here, the adjustment screw for the bar to go in and out, I just make sure it actually went into the hole it's supposed to. You can tell because when you loosen it off, the chain will get slack, which there it is. And watch what happens now when I tighten it. That chain should then suck up and you know the screw is in place. See the chain coming up? So you know it's in the right spot there. All right, uh, one thing I do, you guys might not do this, maybe you do, I don't know. I just get a block of wood. Use this 4x4, four four. actually that's too big. Use this 2x4. And just when I'm uh, just about to do my final tightening on the bar nuts, what I do is I, I take a piece of wood and I set it underneath the bar so that there's a bit of upward pressure on the bar. And that way when I tighten the bar nuts with the tension I want, it'll actually stay there. If I were to tighten it just like this, there is potential after I tighten the bar nuts that I go out and start cutting and there's ever so slight motion of that bar upwards, which then makes my chain a little bit too slack. So I just put it on something. When I'm tightening these for the last time, I put a bit of down pressure that will keep that bar as far up as it'll be. And so it'll never go any further up, especially when you're cutting and you won't have to readjust things. Anyways, uh, let's see here. Tension-wise, 
Uh, you'll get 90 different answers from 90 different people. I'll just do what I do and you guys can decide. I don't want a ton of resistance, but I also don't want it too loose. A little more than that. I like it a little tighter maybe than some. That's pretty good. I don't know what that measurement is. Maybe it's a quarter inch. When I pull up on it, I want it to snap back. I think we'll go with that. And I'm not gonna tighten these to the hills. I'll just snug them up. And I'm just putting a bit of down, downward pressure with my hand here, as I mentioned on the, on the grip. Good enough. If you're ever cutting, in my experience, and you let off the throttle, if that chain stops instantly, you probably have your chain too tight, uh, so you want to back it off a little bit. But as I said, 90 different people. We'll give you 90 different answers. Okay, next thing we're going to do, check the, check the, check the depth gauges. And so I'm going to use this right here. Uh, this is made by who? Oregon. You basically set it on your two teeth in between the two teeth. If you guys duck in here is a depth gauge. Jump on in there. As I was saying, in between two teeth, there's a depth gauge right there. You take this and you set it on and that little slot, you have one of your depth gauges in between it like so, and then I'm just gonna use my flat file and I'm gonna feel, by going back and forth, whether I hit that depth gauge. And this one actually, I don't hit it, and so I'm not gonna grind that down. Then I'll move on to the next. And usually what you're gonna find, if one needs to be ground down, they all need to be ground down. But right now I'm noticing that I must have taken care of this recently because I'm pretty good. This is not a high horsepower saw. I don't know what it is. I think it's 4.3 horsepower or something. And so I don't want to take these down too much because if I take them down too much, the tooth is going to have to do a heck of a lot of cutting on every pass. And this saw has to be able to pull it. And I don't think this is uh, something that this saw is designed for. It's designed to rev high, spin fast, but not uh, do a ton of cutting with every pass. So these dogs are actually good. If they weren't good, I'd take that block again, just give it a little bit of support underneath like so. And um, some people actually leave this in place and, and file it. I don't like to do that because I don't want to file down the material on the top. I just take it off, put my hand here as a guide and uh, you just go to town, you, you give her a few goes. I usually will count one, two, three, on to the next one, two, three, one, two, three, and away you go. So that's it. That saw is good to go. As I mentioned, just make sure there's some fuel in it, put some bar oil in it, back to the woods. All right, guys. Well, there you have it. This is what I generally get up to in the evening when it's really, really cold out, and I'm trying to get my saws back up into tip-top shape to get them back out in the woods. I hang out in here. I get them sharp. I get them clean, and I do a general check of them. What I have here is my Husky 555 Auto-Tune, three years running strong, very, very happy with that. Lots of power, fast revving, really light, relatively speaking. And over here, my limbing saw, my Husky 435. This thing also runs really, really well. That thing's probably a good 10 years old and it starts every single time. Husky's great saws in my books, but let's face it, any saw that will start every single time and can cut a log, that's gonna be a good saw in my book. Aside from that, my Oregon sharpener over here, this thing saves me a lot of time. I still do some round filing from, from time to time, maybe when I'm out in the bush uh, or I'm not anywhere near this, uh, this sharpener. But this thing, I really like it. I have no affiliation with Oregon, but I'm gonna share with you guys when it's a good product. And I like using that for the price. Come on back next time because I am going to continue my evening, nighttime uh, sharpening series, I guess we'll call it. But this time around, I will be back and I will be sharpening my bandsaw blades for my sawmill. This general setup here involves my Woodland Mills tooth setter. I'm going to get those teeth all set, left and right and straight. 
and then I'll get them over here onto my sharpener and get them back into tip top shape just like I did my chainsaws. Anyways, guys, I appreciate you being here. Stay warm out there. If you have a chance to get out there and make some dust with some nice sharp chains or sharp blades, make sure you do that. If you like this video, give her the old thumbs up. Make sure you come back next time and I'll see you then. Thank you.